And this is probably what I would have talked about if, if I've been able to do the banquet. We were talking about last time, mm -hmm. and the changing it, but the vision banquet. A way of understanding, and especially if you've got parents who are still wondering, why is it that you're reading pagan literature, right? So this is more of a vision that will help why should Christians read the pagan classics. And as I was telling the kids earlier, in this speech, when I say pagan, I don't mean University of Alabama frat boys, okay? I mean, you know, the, the pre-Christian Greeks and Romans, right? Now, you know I'm at HBU, and HBU has a vision statement. We call it the 10 pillars. And everybody has to have a vision statement, right? I mean, you know, if you give birth to a child, they need a vision statement on their birth certificate. You know that. Right? I mean, everybody has a mission statement, right? So one of our mission statements is bring Athens and Jerusalem together, right? Now, what does that mean, right? When we say Athens, we mean the, the uh, Greco-Roman legacy. When we say Jerusalem, we mean the Judeo-Christian legacy, and we want to bring them together. And we think it's not only okay to do that, we think it's actually good. And I was saying the other day that, you know, if you go back even 30 years ago, a lot of homeschoolers were Bible only. We don't want to do this stuff. No, this is not good. This is not. Why is it good? This is what's revolutionized classical Christian education. And again, it's ironic, but we are becoming the new stewards of the pagan classics while the secular schools are throwing them out left and right. I mentioned before that there are a growing number of teachers who are proudly saying they've thrown the Odyssey out of ninth grade. Can you imagine being proud of that? It's really, really frightening, okay? So why should Christians read the pagan classics? Um, now, uh, does anybody know where that phrase, Athens and Jerusalem, comes from? Tertullian. Ah, you got it, Tertullian, one of the church fathers, pretty tough guy. And he said, what have Athens to do with Jerusalem? And the way he phrased that question, not much. Now, of course, Tertullian actually was a classic scholar as well, as was Luther. Okay, really, you know, uh, they just got their blood up. You know, it's like Luther when he gets his blood up. You know, those German husbands when they get their blood up. You know? And, and uh, all that sort of stuff. He, he, eating too much bratwurst or yes. something like that. But anyway, the, um, although I'll tell you something funny. Uh, I read this, that, remember there was this big idea that, that chocolate was an aphrodisiac? I've got kids here, but anyway. <laughs> you know, that you're supposed to have these, and, 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 and the, whatever they are, something like that. And I was reading an article that said that, well, yes, chocolate does have some of that, but sausage has five times more. So that's the German secret. Okay. Anyway. So I don't know. <laughs> See, I've already liked this group, so I'm going to tell you more jokes. This is the trouble. <laughs> but we'll, we'll still have fun. The joke. Oh, I forgot. I, I, I do owe you an opening story. I have to give you an opening story. Uh, and it has to be a Houston story because I came from Houston. Now, this story happened. Do you remember Harvey? This happened back in Harvard, right? Yes, sir. You remember, you remember, did you guys get, oh, you guys got hit too? Yeah. Oh, oh, did, oh, you got hit, okay. So, and, and the story is about a Houston, a Houston man who died and went to hell. Now, I want you to understand that that very rarely happens, okay? <laughs> Te, you know, Houston, Texas, God's country, we have, we have it in with the Almighty, that very rarely happens. But this Houstonian dies and he goes to hell. And there he is in hell, shoving the coal, you know, it's like 95 degrees and it's 85% humidity and everybody's miserable and sweating and the devil looks out to survey the damned and he notices the Houstonian is smiling and laughing. And he goes over and he pokes him and says, what are you smiling about? He said, I'm having a great time. This reminds me of my family picnic every June in Houston. I'm having a great time. <laughs> I'll show you, Houstonian. So he goes over to the thermostat and he pumps it up. It's 100 degrees now and 95% humidity. Still laughing, still happy. What are you happy about? This reminds me of the baseball game we play at our company picket, picnic every 4th of July. I'm having a great time. Oh, I'll show you. He goes over, he pumps it up again. It's now 120 degrees and 99% humidity. But you guessed it. He's still laughing and he's still cheering. He's still laughing and smiling. What are you smiling about? This reminds me of our family reunion every August in Houston. Finally, the devil said, I'll show you, Houstonian. He goes over, and instead of putting it up, he puts it down. <laughs> down, 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 till it's negative 20 degrees. There's snow and ice everywhere. The breath from the sinners is so thick you can't see anything. And the devil reaches out, and he parts the fog. And what does he see? 
our custodian is not only continuing to laugh and smile, he is now cheering. And he goes over and stabs him with his pitchfork and says, what are you cheering about? And he says, look around you. This can only mean one thing. The Astros just won the World Series. <laughs> I bet you didn't see where that was going. And, and you understand that's what actually happened after Harvey. So right. hell did indeed freeze over. You know, God did that for New Orleans, too. Remember when they got hit by Katrina? They, they won the, the, the other one. They, they won the Super Bowl. Right? So God still does miracles. Right? That 69 or whatever it was. Anyway. So we go on to talk about why Christians should read the pagan classics. And, and I think you said to everybody, I have an outline for this, too. Yes, sir. Okay, I mean, if you want to you know, reference later, I mean, you should still take notes because you're teachers. You take notes as you do when you do that, right? You take notes in, in, in church, too, right? You're supposed to do that, right? especially if you're a Presbyterian. But, <laughs> anyway, because there will be a quiz afterwards, right? And uh, did Jesus have three-point sermons? I'm not sure, but my preacher seems to think everything was three-point sermons. So anyway, I want to lay down three caveats to help us understand, like, a ground framework for why Christians should read the same classics. And the first question, don't shout out, just think in your head, okay? If you are a Christian, where do you go to find truth in its most perfect and absolute form? Where do you go? Now, many of you are thinking the Bible. That's the wrong answer, okay? Well, if the Bible's not the right answer, what is the right answer? Aha, uh -huh. Jesus is always the right answer, okay? The answer is the one who said... I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6, which happens to be the founding motto of my university, right? At the center of our faith, the place where we find truth in its most perfect embodied form is Christ himself, the Word of God. Now, the other Word of God, the Bible, is the most perfect reflection of that truth. And thank God we have that truth to point to Christ. But we need to understand that the center of truth in Christianity is not a book, it is a person. Now that's particularly important these days because there is a world religion that says the only source of truth is a book. You know what the name of that religion is? It is Islam, okay? right? And does anybody know what, what the Muslims believe about the Quran? Okay, does anybody know what the word Quran means? Oh, you got it. You know, stuff. Okay. Recitation. Okay. It means recite. They believe that the Quran was literally dictated to Muhammad by the archangel Gabriel, and Muhammad was a secretary. There's nothing of. Actually, they believe Muhammad was illiterate. Okay. So, just wait, wait for a second. They believe the Quran was a virgin birth. Do you, you understand what I'm getting at? Because they believe Muhammad was illiterate. Okay. Um, so, they believe that. The Quran is 100% God. It's as if you took the places in our Bible where it says, Thus saith the Lord, and he speaks to the prophets, and that's the whole Bible. If you read the Quran, it is all written in first-person plural from God's point of view. Okay? That is not what we believe. I'm in a Baptist church, and sometimes we think we believe that when we talk about inerrancy. The Bible was not dictated. In the same way that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, our Bible is 100% inspired and 100% written by human beings. So both words of God are <clears throat> incarnation, right? We, we, we need to understand that. Paul did not close his eyes and do what, what, the, what the New Agers call automatic writing. That's how some of my, my students take their final exam. Okay, <laughs> this is not automatic writing. The reason we study so much about the early church is to understand Paul and others because their personality is there as well. It was not an overriding of the mind of the biblical writers, right? It's an incarnation. It is, and again, that's why we use the Word of God for both Christ and the Bible. So we need to understand the, the, the limits of that, okay? That it is the absolute Word of God, it's inerrant, it's authentic, and all of that sort of stuff. But it points to Christ, the center of our faith. And in fact, if you've ever done you know, what they call comparative religion, and you want to compare the two, you don't say Christ is to Muhammad as the Bible is to the Quran. It's actually, as weird as it sounds, it's the opposite. Christ is to the Quran as the Bible is to Muhammad. Because 
They believe the Quran is reading their salvation. The Quran is the perfect incarnation of God. That's why, do you know what Muslims don't really allow for when it comes to the Quran? They don't allow for translations. I mean, they exist, but they don't accept translations. So you've got all these uh, uh, Asian uh, Muslims in, in uh, Indonesia saying prayers in an Arabic language they don't even know, okay? Um, because they believe it. But no, in our, you know, there were times when people, you know, acted like Latin was the only thing you could read it in, when it wasn't even the original language, right? Um, the Vulgate. But no, the Bible is something that needs to be translated into every language, right? And by the way, you know, if we're even, you know, if we're Baptists or Presbyterian, we don't have saints, right? But we actually do have saints. We call them Wycliffe Bible translators, okay? That's our version of a saint. And everybody's amazed by those people. They're just incredible, right? And what they're doing is they're taking the Bible and incarnating it in another language and another culture. Okay? So we are an incarnation. We are people of the book, okay? But first, we're people of Christ, and that book is what tells us the truth about Christ. Really, there may be some exceptions, but it's not that you believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, and therefore, you believe in Christ. It's really the opposite. You come to know Christ as your Savior, and then you recognize the authority of Scripture because you know Christ. Right? You know, I, so, I, I, you know, I, I believe the Old Testament because Jesus believed it. Okay? Mm -hmm. He authenticates it as he authenticates the New Testament. Now, why is this important? It's important because if the center of our religion, if the center of truth is a person, that means that bits and pieces of that truth can appear in all different places. Again, only in the Bible do we have something completely authoritative and completely trustworthy. But if the center of truth is a person, the incarnate Christ, we can find parts of that truth in all different places. Okay, so that's the first caveat, that the, the, the center of truth is a person rather than just a book. Okay? The second one is, all people yearn for God. Okay? Yes, we are fallen and depraved, but we were made in God's image, and we all, the pagans, all yearn for God in one way or another. I'm sure a lot of you uh, are in love with that. Oh, it's not the very first sentence, but it's about the fourth sentence of Augustine's Confessions, where Augustine says, O oh Lord, you made us for yourself, and... Our hearts are restless until we find rest in thee. Our hearts are restless until we find rest in thee. Right? That's, that's kind of what we're getting at. We, we have that <coughs> desire, and of course, you know, <coughs> desire is at the center of everything C.S. Lewis wrote. Right? And he's very, very Augustinian. Right? Um, or, that famous line from Ecclesiastes, that God has written eternity on the hearts of men. Right? That we have, it's often put this way, we have a uh, a, a, a God-shaped vacuum in our soul, right? And you've probably heard that one way of doing apologetics. That phrase comes from uh, Pascal. We have a God-shaped vacuum. We try to fill it with bad things, but we also try to fill it with good things, like religion or mother love or patriotism or whatever. Uh, but nothing fills it, right? It's like, it's like that game when you were a kid where you have the, the board and it's got a little circle, a little square, and you've got the pegs and you've got to put them in. Right, and it only fits. Right, uh, I, I, I'm from a state uh, where uh, that's the uh, that's the uh, test you take to get into Texas A&M. If you know that, yeah. <laughs> do you tell Aggie jokes on here? I just my cousins there. Oh, they're oh, no, <laughs> You know, you, you you're not allowed to make, make fun of or offend anybody nowadays, but you can still tell Aggie jokes because when you tell Aggie jokes, nobody gets offended. Because if they're not Aggies, they don't get offended. If they are Aggies, they don't get the joke. And so they're not <laughs> So, always safe to make Aggie jokes. What, what is your Aggie school in Alabama? Alabama? Is this Alabama? The whole state of Alabama? Is that what you... University of Alabama. Oh, University of Alabama. Okay. Uh, did you, is there an Alabama state? No. Yes. yes. Auburn. Oh, that's Auburn. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they fight back and forth. My father in law is from Houston. He's a huge Aggie, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, be quite true. all these yeah. Wendell Berry fans here, I mean, you should like it. I mean, it's A&M, &A it's agriculture and machinery or whatever. Yeah, I mean, that's that's right. you know, building this country and stuff like that. Uh, but again, we have that God shaped vacuum, and all people have it, right? And a lot of those desires find their way into the great pagan literature. That doesn't mean they're right, okay? But it does mean that they're responding to that yearning inside of them, right? Now here's the third one. The Bible is not a textbook. 
The Bible was never meant to tell us everything there is to know. It does tell us everything we need to know to find salvation in Christ and to live a Christian life. But it doesn't and never intended to tell us everything there is to know. Let, let me expand on this. The Bible is not a dating book. <laughs> any, of you, any of you terrorized by kiss, I kiss dating goodbye? Yeah. Well, there's a sort of, there you are, there we go. Well, there's a sort of sad ending to that story because that dude kissed Christianity goodbye. Uh -huh. Look what happened to him. And he kissed his wife goodbye and then he kissed Christianity goodbye. Just, you know, again, we can find principles, obviously, in the Bible. But this meaning, this is a very American thing, that we have this idea that the specific answer to everything has to be in the Bible. And again, the, the answer to the deepest questions of life are there. But the Bible never intended to be that. Here's another one. <clears throat> For some of you ladies, maybe, the Bible is not a dieting. Any of you terrorized by Ezekiel bread? <laughs> I, I say this because a lot of conservative Christian like homeschool moms are into this, okay? All the answers to nutrition are in the Bible. Really? Folks, just listen. Jesus did not fast for 40 days and 40 nights because he was on a diet, okay? He wasn't doing some new purge, okay? It's not, let's live on locusts and wild honey. And that's not what uh, John the Baptist was doing, okay? Again, they're a principle, but again, we just have this weird idea that we have to find, and sometimes it gets dangerous. I mean, like a lot of you, I grew up premillennial, and maybe that's right. But I am afraid that you'll get some real hardcore people that are like, well, if you take it real literally, that means the Jews have to rebuild the temple. But they can't rebuild the temple as long as the Dome of the Rock is there, so let's blow up the Dome of the Rock and start World War III, okay? We don't push God's hand, okay? By the way, if they ever did blow up the Dome of the Rock, and rebuild the temple, and start the animal sacrifices again, the Jews would have to deal with a much more terrifying foe than the terrorists. They would have to deal with Peter. Okay. Get that? That would be much more terrifying. Anyway. We're having fun. We're a big family now. This is great fun. Okay. So, those are the three things. Because the Bible is not a textbook, we should read other books. Okay, we, I guess we don't need anything but the Bible, but you know what? Nobody needs a college education. Nobody needs a high school education. There's very little that we need, okay? But if God gives us the ability to grow in our wisdom and learn, we should learn, okay? After all, Moses was trained in all the wisdom of the Moses was t trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, okay? Uh, Joseph was also trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Daniel was trained in the wisdom first of the Babylonians and then the Persians, okay? So, and, and, they, and, they, and people understood this. You know, the, the medieval writers, under, starting with Augustine, under, even earlier, really, Origen, they called it, you ever heard the phrase, despoiling the Egyptians? Okay, what, what that means is when the Jews were leaving on the Exodus, what, what did God tell them to do? Remember? To plunder. Good to plunder. plunder. Ask your neighbors, give silver me some gold and silver. And, and thus they went. And a lot of early church fathers used that as a metaphor for taking the pagan wisdom and using it for Christ. Uh, do you actually at the school read the venerable bead? Yeah. You actually teach it. Oh, that's impressive. Okay? That's the ecclesiastical history of the British people, the venerable bead. And Maybe you taught them that one of the things that the early Christians did is that they took some of the pagan sites, they, you know, they exercised them, what do you want to say, broke them down, and then they re-consecrated them as Christian churches. Okay? Pretty amazing. Right? And, and you know, a lot of people say it's legendary now, but the idea of, of St. Patrick you know, using the three-leaf clover to teach the Trinity, that may be, but he still did things like that. That's why Celtic Christianity is still a pretty cool thing. Its ability to make connections, just like we make connections between the Greeks and Romans, they were making connections between the sort of you know, Norse, those, those kind of people, the Nordic people, and the, the Beowulf people, right, and Anglo-Saxons, and finding connections there as well, right? Uh, and that's, that's what Beowulf is. Beowulf is a, written by an anonymous Christian monk, but he's writing it in a pre-Christian mode, which is the same thing, Boethius. It's actually the same thing that happens in The Lord of the Rings. Because Middle Earth is the Earth, but it's the Earth before even Abraham was called. Okay, it's, it's very, very before there. It's pre-Christian, but it's also pre-Jewish. It was way back to the beginning. 
Uh, and that's what uh, Till We Have Faces does that. There's a lot of books, uh, the, 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 what's it called, The Knight's Tale from Canterbury Tales, does that. that this is a, a sort of genre of writing a Christian work, but in a pre-Christian mode, showing how everything points forward. Right? So uh, we, we should study other things. We should study other books. W within reason, okay, I wouldn't tell you to, and by the way, in the book of Acts, when they have a book burning, can anybody tell me what they're burning? They're not burning Homer and Virgil and Aeschylus. What are they burning? You remember this, the story in Acts? They're burning books of spells, okay? Actual books of spells to control people, right? Black magic, we sometimes call that, right? And it's a big deal because a lot of those books were made, you know, had gold filament or whatever. They were really expensive and they were destroyed. So we're, this is not a book burning the way we think of you know, what's going to start happening right now in our country, actually. It's not that kind of book burning, okay? They are giving away their actual evil spell books, okay? They're giving up that. Uh, but they're not giving up wisdom. And I'm writing a book right now, the sequel to one of the ones I sold, uh, on the early church. And all the early apologists use the word logos. Right Now, that's in the beginning was the logos, the word. That's a Greek word, a word from Greek philosophy used by people like Plato. And they used it to build a bridge. And they, a lot of them did. I was surprised how much uh, they do that uh, to use it to build it. One of my favorites is Clement. You ever teach Clement of Rome? Okay. What does what story does he use to illustrate the resurrection? You know, it's a story of a mythical animal, or legendary animal. The phoenix. The phoenix, right? Birds up again. And I love how people, oh, you know, he's so credulous. He believes in the phoenix. Okay, well, maybe he did, and maybe he didn't. But folks, I'm sorry. If none of you actually knew what a butterfly was, and I explained it to you, you would think I was making it up. Is it, the butterfly is just as crazy as, as the phoenix, if not crazier. Okay, so I mean, why should we laugh at it for believing that? Okay, I, the world is full of strange wonders. Okay, wonders to behold. Right. So anyway, those are sort of the caveats. Now, to help us understand how to bring Athens to Jerusalem, or another way to call, tell you how do you bring Christ and culture together? Uh, did any of you ever read, maybe in school, a book called Christ and Culture by H. Richard Niebuhr? It's about 60 years old now. Uh, H. Richard Niebuhr is the brother of Reinhold Niebuhr. And he was actually quite a bit more orthodox, really, if you read both of their books. And in this book, I think it's about 60 years old, maybe closer to 70 now, he wanted to look at different ways of bringing together Christ and culture. And he means pretty much the thing as Athens and Jerusalem, because the, the secular surrounding culture and the Christian culture, how do they interact? And he comes up with five different paradigms. And I'm going to talk about the two extremes and one of the middle ones that is, is you know, it, it encapsulates what we're trying to do at Classical Christian School. So, the two extremes are called Christ against culture and the Christ of culture. Now, Christ against culture is very much the Old Testament model, be ye separate from the unbeliever, okay? It is keeping it away, right? You, you circle the wagons. <clears throat> the closest to the modern day would be something like the Amish, right? Where you separate yourself from the secular world and sort of build a fence and stay pure. Now, I still think there's room for that. I mean, maybe if you're a monk or a nun or something like that, right? Um, but that really is more of an old time, right? We were, we're meant to be salt and light. We're meant to be in the world, but not of the world. But we still need to be in the world. That's uh, John chapter 17, the, the, the high priestly prayer that Jesus gives, right? Um, and uh, again, we, we need to be careful. Like I said, there might be a time to pull back and whatnot, but we should engage the culture and not be terrified of it. The other extreme is the Christ of culture. That means we take whatever the secular culture is doing and we just sort of Christianize it and we accept it. And that's more or less what the sort of liberal mainline denominations did. Okay? That's why there are so many different Presbyterian groups and Methodist groups because they're trying to break away from the people that are just accommodating to everything. Uh, what was that guy's name? Bishop Spong. Uh, the church must change or die. You know, shouldn't that guy have lost his job? I'm sorry, if I'm a bishop and I no longer believe like in the resurrection, shouldn't I lose my job? Wouldn't they fire me if I said, actually, I don't believe in literature at all? I don't believe anybody can learn anything. Well, I mean, I should be fine. I, I, I don't understand it. It's crazy. Okay. But this is the idea of enchanted. And sometimes, sometimes we go to the other team of forming our own Christian subculture. 
Anybody old enough to remember Christian aerobics? Right? It was all you know, aerobics, you know, when you're doing the exercise to music. It was, that, was the, that was the new Jane Fonda. She sold all these things. And so the Christians did exactly the same thing, but used Christian music. Okay? I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it's like we, all we can do is imitate and mimic the culture and form our own little Christian subculture inside. Okay? Well, is there anything in between? He's got three of them, but the one I want to focus on, he calls Christ over culture. And that means if you take the surrounding culture and find the best that is in it, you can lift it up into the fullness of Christ. And that's very much what the medieval church did. That's what, okay, did any of you grow up in a home or have friends that are really, really conservative and they won't celebrate Christmas? Some of you okay? And, 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 and you know, I understand. They're like, oh, it's got pagan roots to it. Well, it does, okay? And it's probably late to Constantine. How do you take a huge group of pagans and bring them into the Christian church? Well, one way you do it is find a bridge. Build a bridge and find a point of connection. If the pagans are already celebrating during, see, December 25th used to be December 21st. It was the what we call the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, but also when it starts getting bigger. And that was the birthday of the unconquerable sun. Right, Sol Invictus in Latin. It was also, though, the time of the Saturnalia. The Romans believe, it, read Aeneid, chap, Aeneas, Aeneid chapter 8, book 8, and you'll, there's this old myth that when Saturn, that, that his, that's, the, that's the Latin version of Kronos, when Saturn and his titans were running away from the Olympians during the big battle, right, Dad? They were hiding out in Italy. And that, according to Virgil, probably faulty, Etymology, but according to Virgil, the reason it's called Latium, right? Latin comes from Latium, is because that's when the gods were latent, like they were hidden. Right? Like, like Grandma Moses had a latent talent for artistry that didn't come out until she was 70, whatever age it was, right? So that, that's what he says, Latium. Does anybody, does anybody teach the Aeneid here? You love me, remember that. But in Latin, you remember it. It's, it's, it's when he visits Evander who lives in Rome, what will be Rome, right? And uh, quiz the teachers. <laughs> The, uh... So anyway, because of that, they believed that when Saturn was in Italy, and this is what Virgil tells, it was a golden age. Right? Well, kind of like a Garden of Eden, man close to God, close to everything, wonderful, and then they fell away into the age of silver and bronze and iron, all the way down there. And so every year, about the same time, they had a Mardi Gras-like festival they called the Saturnalia. Anything goes, everybody throwing off their cares, people would cross-dress, People, New Orleans, people would, even like rich and poor would, you know, dress differently. I mean, it was, it was just a, a safety valve. And, and so these two things are coming together around December 25th. And so what a good time to put Christmas. Now, for some people, that's the church watering down the faith. But I would call it an act of cultural apologetics, a way of reaching out and building a bridge and drawing people into Christ. If you can find a sort of overlap there. Right? And so that would be an example of Christ over culture. Okay, folks, anytime you find something in Greek mythology, like a tragedy, that is really close to Christianity, there's three different ways to read it. Well, there's four different. One way is a coincidence. But, you know, you probably wouldn't be teaching at the school if you thought it was a coincidence, right? Then who cares, okay? So if it's not a coincidence, there's three ways of reading it. One way of reading it, I would call that Christ against culture, that what you're reading in the Greek myth is a demonic deception to pervert the gospel story that's coming. Now, I'm not saying that that's possible sometimes, okay? The other extreme, Christ of culture, would be, well, that just proves that Christianity is nothing more than a myth. Okay, Christianity is just the Hebrew version of the same myth. So it's all myth. There's nothing historical or real about it. But in the middle, maybe Christ over culture, God was using that to prepare the pagan people for the coming of the gospel. Or because God had written eternity in their hearts, that real God-implanted yearning is manifesting itself in this. You know, Think, just think about this, okay? Okay. Did this ever bother any of you? Are you telling me that until Christ came, 
God absolutely ignored 99% of humanity and only cared about the Jews? Right? Well, only to the Jews did he speak directly, right? But he didn't ignore everybody else. It comes out in their stories, in their yearnings, in their dreams, in their myths, right? In their philosophy and things like that, right? So that's Christ. Now, what hurts Christ over culture, okay? This is very, very important. And I joke about it, but I speak for a lot of Presbyterian churches, okay? Because they really have spearheaded this, starting with Douglas Wilson and all. And really, for a long time, if you were a Presbyterian in America, you didn't talk about natural law. That was a Catholic thing. Again, we don't believe it. The reason for that is our country, for a long time, has had a terrible misunderstanding. I believe that even Nathaniel Hawthorne misunderstood it. A terrible misunderstanding of what total depravity means. Okay, what total depravity means is that every part of our person was subjected to the fall. So body and soul are fallen. Our reason is fallen. Our imagination is fallen. There's no part of us that hasn't been touched by the fall. Okay? But for a lot of people, especially in America, we confuse that with utter depravity. And that's, that's why, okay, you all know that C.S. Lewis believed in mere Christianity. So in his books, he very rarely makes distinctions between different, like he doesn't really get off on the on exactly what the Lord's Supper is or baptism or the Virgin Mary. But in a couple of his books, particularly the problem, he comes out directly and says, I don't believe in total depravity, right? He like takes it on. But that's because, again, what he's really against is utter depravity. The idea that we are so fallen that we have somehow lost the Imago Dei, the image of God, and our black could be God's white and our white could be God's black. You know, God's ways are above our ways. But that doesn't mean his black is our white and our white is our black. It's more like Lewis says, uh, a kid trying to draw a circle, right? And then he sees a real circle. He says, oh yeah, that's what I was trying to do. I couldn't do it, but I recognize now that that's what I was trying to do. Okay, so we need to be careful we don't give way to such a dark vision of man that we're incapable of any kind of virtuous behavior, which is simply not true. We still have the image of God. That's why we can have virtuous pagans, right? Uh, I talked about Luther when his blood is up. His blood was really up in a book called Bondage of the Will. Did you ever read that? That was his war with Erasmus, back and forth, right? And uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a Protestant and I'm glad, but if I lived back then, I would have been Erasmus. Erasmus has my favorite line. Erasmus said, I would like to believe that I would be willing to lay down my life for Christ. I'm quite sure that I'm not willing to die for Martin Luther. Okay, so I thought, and that, that, that's just pragmatism at its best. But, anyway, but, the, uh, but again, Luther, who was, by the way, a classic scholar, and Bondage of the Will has at least 20 references to Cicero and every other person. So he, was, he had a good Augustinian education. But his blood is up, and he says, apart from grace, there is only wrath. Apart from light, there is only darkness. Apart from the way, there is only error. Now, to a certain extent, that is true, okay? But when we push it to the wall, it's like we're dropping down a wall and we're saying, here's Christianity, and outside of Christianity is absolute error and darkness and horror. And that's just not the way things are. Non-Christian people are capable of virtuous behavior. That virtuous behavior is not going to save them, okay? It's not salvific, but they are capable. Every, you know, okay, a lot of you know mere Christianity? Okay. Book one of mere Christianity is an argument for theism. That's all it is. Book two takes you from theism to Christianity. But book three is a book about living the Christian life, about morality and ethics, and then book four is about theology. What I love about book three, about morality and ethics, he spends as much time quoting Aristotle as Christianity. Because Aristotle got most of it right. Basic understanding of morality, just like he got most of the logos, pathos, he, a lot of those things he just got right. The logic we teach, it's still Aristotelian. You know, people keep coming up with newfangled definitions, but it's still the same, okay? Logic really hasn't changed uh, in, in, a, in a radical way from, you know, from induction and deduction and everything else, and with the memes and all the things that Aristotle taught us, right? So he got some things right, okay? But where he's wrong, we obviously go with the Bible. Okay, now, all of that was like preparatory to give you my visionary statement, how I put this together. This is the way I put it. Christianity is not the only truth. 
And did you really bring a Southern Baptist from Houston to tell you that Christianity is not the only truth? But I'll say it again. Christianity is not the only truth, but it is the only complete truth. Let me explain that. If we say Christianity is the only truth, again, we're dropping the wall down and everything outside of Christianity is absolute darkness and ignorance and error. But if we say Christ is the only complete truth, then that means that you can find bits and pieces of truth in all different cultures and religions and everything else, but only in Christianity, really only in Christ, the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, is do we find truth in its absolute perfect form. When I was growing up in the 70s, people loved to say, well, truth is at the top of the hill, and there's many ways around it. I actually say, I accept that metaphor, right? The truth at the top of the hill, though, is the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there's many ways. I love listening to testimonies of people from other countries. The amazing way. The, um, what? Uh, this is something I learned from Robbie Zacharias. I don't even want to, just it's so heartbreaking. But anyway, I listened to a story. Just tell me there are not many different ways around that mountain. Somebody told a testimony in Robbie's show, and this guy was uh, Vietnamese, and it was during the Vietnamese War, and he was a prisoner of war, and his job was to clean the toilets, okay? There was like latrines used by all the party members, and he had a terrible, okay? As he was cleaning the latrines, he found out that those wonderful, you know, uh, communists, Chinese communists, were using the Bible for toilet paper. They were ripping up the Bible and using it for toilet paper. And he saw it and read one, and then he started rescuing them, cleaning them up, right? And that's how he became a Christian. Okay, so, man, God God knows how to write screenplays that are just, you know, facts stranger than fiction, as they say, right? Amazing stuff like that. Okay, so, the image I want to give you is Rio de Janeiro. What did happen in Rio de Janeiro? The mountain Jesus with his arms stretched out. That's the one that that, that bird smacked into in the cartoon, right? Okay, arms open wide, okay? Um, Jesus, the light of the world. I can't remember the name. What is the name of that? Uh, there's a name for that statue. I think it might be light of the world. But anyway. Up there, and again, there's lots of different ways. But if we persist following the desire that God gave us, not our lusts, not concupiscence, but the actual desire God gave us, if we keep following it, it will lead us there. As it leads who in the last battle? Oh, I'm sorry. As it leads who in the last battle to the truth by following his desire? Ever heard of a guy named Emmeth? That's the Kalorman? Yeah. That expects to see Tash, but he sees Aslan and he's accepted in. Okay, I, I knew one Christian who was very, very conservative. She's like, I did not read the last battle to my child until he was old enough to rep to understand the heresy in it. I said, no, no, no. Lewis is not preaching universal salvation. It would only be universal salvation if Emmeth came there and he looked at Aslan and said, Sir, I'm here for the Tash part of heaven. Can you direct me? Then it would be universal salvation. But he comes before Aslan and realizes that Tash is false and Aslan is real. And Aslan understands that all of his desires are leading to this moment. Now, it does border on something that's not really, that is borderline heretical. And that's what we call post-mortem salvation. Because all Christians believe once you die, all bets are off. But Lewis says, we don't understand. The moment of our death is an eternal moment. The moment of our death is a moment that includes every single moment that ever happened, right? When Jesus descended into hell and preached to those in prison, right? That wasn't just something that happened 2,000 years ago. He's always preaching, right? Time does, eternity doesn't work like time. There is no prisoner that Jesus has not preached to in Hades, right? It's what he says. Wild idea. We, we have this idea that, that eternity means time going on forever. But eternity means no time. Eternity is a perpetual present. It's always now in heaven. Right? Did, you, did you learn about this in school? Uh, oh, We're okay. talking about it. Oh, yay! Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Because of Augustine? Or what were you uh, reading? The Great Force. Uh, oh, the, oh, yeah, oh, what you just said. That's it. But it all goes back to Augustine. Yeah. Augustine says the same thing about time. Uh, in fact, the confessions, after he finishes his life story, he talks about time for the next three books. And then he talks about Genesis for the last book. Right? So he's obsessed with time and memory and eternity and all that stuff. So great stuff. I thought you were a professor. I had to teach her for a second. I was all grown up. She's a student. The, um, the kids are growing up fast. My kids are 26 and 24, which is hard to believe since I'm only 40. But anyway. The, uh, okay. Oh, that's why you're wearing the mask. There's a little one there. I just saw that. Hey, that's exciting. 
<laughs> we call this a COVID baby? You could. <laughs> COVID baby. Okay, so I don't think, you know, I wonder if there's gonna be a lot of babies exactly nine months after that one week freeze. <laughs> or many ways to keep warm, I tell you, okay? So now, you know, it might. That'll be interesting to look for that. Okay? Too much fun. I gotta keep an eye on you. Oh, is that purpose? You don't want your students to look at the clock? Oh, oh! So I didn't even see it. Okay, okay, good, good. Keep, keep an eye on the time. Okay, I actually make it to the airport. Um, okay, so to illustrate what I'm talking about, this idea that Christ is at the top of the hill, and if we continue our journey, we will reach him. Okay, but then we have a choice to make. My favorite part of the Christmas story is the story of the Magi. Now, who were the Magi? Obviously, there weren't Christians because there weren't any yet. But they also weren't Jews. Many think they were Zoroastrians, probably from Persia. They didn't have access to the Old Testament. Right? They just had a limited amount of wisdom. Right? They knew how to study the stars. Right? And they followed that star, what we call the Star of Bethlehem. And it took them on a long, long journey. And that star led them to the Christ child. Now, when they got there, they could have said, you have got to be kidding me. We came a thousand, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. And that's the last time I follow a stupid star. But that's not what they said. What they said is, yes, this is what we have been looking for all our lives. I never could have guessed it. But now that I see it, I recognize that this is the Son of God. And we know they said that because they knelt down and worshipped him. They didn't just give him gifts. They knelt down and worshipped the child and gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Okay, right? And are any of you going to name one of your children frankincense? Where does that come from? Nobody knows. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Never seen Seven Brides or Seven Brothers? Yeah. Yeah. They call him Frankincense because he smells so sweet. Okay, now you remember. He's Frank, but he's really... I don't remember a Frank in the Bible, she says. Frankincense. Yes, that's love. Um, <laughs> tell your students, a, a musical based on the rape of the Sabine women. Who would have thought it possible? But it really was. We should really say the abduction. Okay. So, so, what happened was that the pagan magi could not have guessed. They couldn't have invented their salvation. But they followed the limited light that God gave. They followed their desire, their God-implanted desire. And it led them to the Christ. And again, they could have rejected it, as others did. But they recognized it and began. Look at Anybody ever heard of a guy named Cornelius? Okay. Cornelius was a Roman centurion. He was a pagan. Now, they call him a God-fearing pagan, right? But still, he's not a Jew, right? But, are you like, you like Cornelius? He's a great character. And here is somebody that says, this is kind of shocking, but God notices him because of his good works. Now, his good works don't save him, okay? But God seems pleased by his virtue. Was, was Jesus pleased? By the virtue of another centurion? Oh, come on. When was Jesus pleased by a centurion? When he said what? Was it the doctor? It was, it, it was, his, was, was the servant. Servant. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and, he, and, and Jesus said, okay, let's go. He said, no, no, no. no just I'm not worthy to have you under my roof. But what? If you just say it. No. And, and why? Remember why? What does he say? I am mm -hmm. a man under authority. Yeah. But I have people under my authority. And if I say to one, go, he goes. And if I say, I don't have to see them do it, I know he will go. Therefore, you only have to give the word, and my servant will be healed. And what does Jesus say? I have not seen such faith amongst the people of Israel. Jesus is impressed. Isn't that cool? Don't you love it when your teachers are, have you ever seen the look of impressed look on, on her face? And you're like, I know I did something good here, okay? And, and you've, seen, you've seen the dark face, too, so you're really going to be good. And you smile. I mean, Jesus is, by the way, it says that Jesus was amazed. The, the Greek word is a real strong word. There's only one other time that Greek word is used in the Gospels. You know what it is? When Jesus was amazed by the lack of faith of the people in his hometown of Nazareth. And he couldn't do any miracles there. Right? That's the two. Amazed by the lack of faith of his own people. Amazed by the faith. And not just faith, but the sort of 
understanding, true understanding of this centurion. By the way, every time we meet a centurion in gospel or acts, they're always virtuous. Okay? Because the, there was the other centurion uh, who helped Paul when he was uh, on, on, the, on the ship, to, taking him to Rome and all that sort of stuff. I mean, every time we meet them, they're noble. They, another centurion saved uh, Paul from a mob. I mean, it's amazing, right? Uh, the Romans did some pretty good things. That's why they were considered the good pagans. Okay, that doesn't mean they were nice people all the time. Okay, but compared to the others, they were the good pagans that God used to prepare the world for the coming of Christ. Right? And we all have to study the Romans because that's when God chose to visit. Okay? So we need to understand them. So Cornelius, it's, it's like God notices and he sends Peter with the gospel. Now, Cornelius could not have guessed it on his own. He couldn't have saved himself. But when Peter comes and preaches... He recognizes the truth of it, and he and his whole household are saved and baptized right there. Right? They even start speaking in tongues, man. It's, uh, when, 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 when did, when, wasn't there a big Pentecostal revival in Pensacola? Where I flew into? I mean, many years ago, 20 years ago? Oh. The Pensacola revival? Am I remembering yeah, that right? Yes, and I can't remember his name, but yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it went a little strange. People started yeah. barking like dogs and all, but in the beginning, it was, it was pretty cool. Okay, It was the Pensacola. Then another one happened up in Canada. The Toronto Blessing or something. And that was pretty cool because people had forgotten there, there were actually Christians in Canada. I think there are a few. Yeah. The, um, when I teach history, I teach them the importance of the Battle of Tours. What was it 722 uh, when the Muslims almost conquered France? And they were stopped by a guy named, you know? Uh, Martel, Charles Martel. So, you got him in! My five right there. See? Right there, beat the teachers. Charles Martel <laughs> stopped. The Muslims from taking over France, and if it wasn't for Charles Martel, today, France would be a Muslim country. Wait a minute. France is a Muslim country. <laughs> <laughs> the kids are getting it, right? Okay, so that's good. I love it. Can you tell us what Charles Martel means? Charles? Uh, the, hammer. the hammer! He's got it down there, too! Okay, but it, 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 you got to blow me away now. Who is Charles Martel's grandson? Charlotte. <laughs> hey, see, that? see that, folks? Right there. Teachers, go back to school. Okay. That is Charlemagne, which means Charles the Great. He yeah. got it from us. And, you know, we oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember, you always tell them when I tell my students, you say, I taught you everything you know, but I didn't teach you everything I know. So you've got to remember that. Line. You always got to keep it. That was probably all Thornberry, wasn't it? Yeah. Ah, there we go. Just left. Thornberry. Not so. Greg Thorn. No, that's a different guy. The one that was the head of... Oh, oh, this one. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm mixing up. Who's the guy who was the head of, uh, of King's College? Wasn't he Thornberry? Or Thorn something? Greg Thorn? Yeah, something. Maybe the same guy. Close. Maybe it's not Thornberry. Something close to that. He used to be at Union. Uh, and then he went over to King's College. Anyway, see, we're one big happy family. This is fun. You're getting a little uh, afternoon of improv at the same time. <laughs> okay, so now, how does all this work? What, what is the theology? that allows for what I'm arguing. And there is a theology. And guess what? Go back to Presbyterians. This theology is laid out exactly in the first couple books of Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. Also, it's laid out clearly in the Calvinist Bible. Does anybody know what the Calvinist Bible is? It's Paul's Epistle to the Romans and a few other books. Okay, you heard that? You say, well, my great Calvinist jokes here. Okay. The, uh, I guess you guys just weren't predestined to find them funny. Anyway, the, uh, okay, there we go. We say that. Okay. That's a new one. I'll use that again. Okay. What are we getting? Okay. In Christian theology, and this is something that is equally in Calvin and Thomas Aquinas. Okay? Can't get more mere Christianity than that. It's in Thomas Aquinas and it's Calvin. It's clear. It's a distinction between what is called general revelation and special revelation, okay? General revelation is the way that God speaks to all people. Special revelation is when he speaks directly to the Jewish people, through the prophets, through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, and supremely through Christ. Okay, now, how does general revelation work? Well, Romans chapter 1 says that the pagans are without excuse. Why? Do you remember they could have known about God's majesty and glory through what? Nature. You got it, through nature, right? Through creation, right? God's power and majesty are written clear. Now, that doesn't mean you can look at the creation and say, ah, 
I must accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. Right? You need special revelation, the gospel preached. Right? But you can look at nature, at the creation, and see the fingerprint of the creator. A lot of what we call intelligent design today. You can see God's glory and holiness even, and power. Right? Now, let's go to Romans 2. Romans 2, and again, this is also in Calvin. Romans 2 gives us the second major vehicle of general revelation. And it says that the, the pagans who are without the law are a law unto themselves because the law has been what? It's been written on their hearts, now accusing, now you know, condemning them, right? And it's what we call the conscience. And always let your conscience be your conscience. <laughs> Give a little whistle. Have you all seen Pinocchio? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, they, they do. Good. I think that's been canceled, by the way. I'm not sure why, but I think it's been one of the canceled. I guess because it makes Italians look bad? I, I don't even know. I, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I haven't read that yet, but apparently it's been canceled as well. Um, anyway, somebody told me they're making a live-action Pinocchio. That could be why. I don't know. <laughs> Every live action is either is either bad or absolutely unnecessary. What's the point? What's the point, really? Okay. What's the point? Anyway, scene by scene remake. What's the point? Okay. So the general revelation comes to us through creation and through our conscience, right? Through what C.S. Lewis called the tab. Right. Other ways, it comes to us through our reason. It comes to us through our imagination. Lewis said before the coming of Christ. God spoke in three ways. He spoke through the Jewish people that he set apart. He spoke through our conscience. And he spoke through the good dreams of the pagans. And a wonderful line. It's in Mere Christianity. The good dreams of the pagans. So God speaks that way. That's how these people have access, how they can get things that are right. They're not 100% right. But they are pointing towards the truth. The best way that I can explain the difference between a general and special revelation is with the psalm that C.S. Lewis said was his favorite psalm. And that would be a really tough trivia question. And he wrote a book called Reflections on the Psalms. And he said his favorite psalm was Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of the Lord. The skies are proclaiming his handiwork. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they are not silent. The first half of Psalm 19 talks about God's hand in nature, in creation. The heavens are telling the glory of the Lord. But in the second half of Psalm 19, do you know what the psalmist starts talking about instead? It's talking about something that is, you know, beautiful and wonderful and whatnot. It's the law. Okay? It's a celebration of the law. Now, in the first half, of the psalm that's talking about general revelation seen through creation. It says, the heavens are telling the glory of God. It's, it's the generic word for God. Right? You know, even Allah is actually just a generic name for God. Uh, Christians in the Middle East call God Allah too, because it's actually just a generic name, like our, our name God. Right? So when they're talking about general revelation, it's just God. But in the second half, when they start talking about the law, Guess what <coughs> word they use for God? Yahweh. Yahweh, his covenant name, right? I am that I am, right? Isn't that interesting? So, so in nature, God speaks to us generically, but in the law revealed to Moses, he speaks to us directly on a first name basis. This is my name and this is who I am. So that's the distinction. Okay? And so what we're talking about is in the, you know, you did that exactly at the same time. Awesome. Just, a, just a good friend or something like that. We're twins, actually. Oh, you are twins, okay. That's trippy. Are you, uh, it's kind of hard to say. I guess you're identified, but no. No, yeah, I'm saying, you know, the more you look, it's like, they, they should put you like on, on, the, on the back of you know, one of those kids' books, like Find the Differences or something. Kind of cool. <laughs> that would be a lot of fun. <laughs> You're not with them. You look a little bit like these two girls. <laughs> <laughs> triplets. Like, What's that? Triplets. triplets. Who's that? They're her. Who, who, oh, oh, okay, I can see it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Might be your sister over here. <laughs> but the, uh, what? This is a big family thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, so, the, uh, so, again, that, that's how it works, okay? That it's because of general revelation that pagan writers 
can say things that have truth in them. And we need to access it. Now, the newest book I wrote, The Myth Made Fact, reading Greek and Roman mythology through Christian eyes, right? I am taking for granted that in those great Greco-Roman myths, there are going to be seeds of truth, right? That God has spoken, but indirectly. And if we have eyes to see and ears to hear, we may be able to see bits and pieces of truth that God used to prepare the world. Okay, now, I've gone too long without giving you a very good biblical uh, you know, passage that proves all of this. Okay? Now, anybody that is working in classical Christian education and is really getting into the sort of theory and vision behind it, your favorite and most important passage in the Bible has got to be Acts chapter 17. Okay? So, Paul and Barnabas go on three missionary journeys. I'm sorry, Paul goes on three missionary journeys. He got rid of and he picked up Silas. Where was Silas? Right. Was there a Silas? But, well, that's my son. Yeah. Oh, that was your son. Oh, that, I, I signed it. I didn't yeah. Okay. So, the first missionary journey took them through uh, Turkey. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Took, it took them through Cyprus and then a little part of Turkey. Okay. The second missionary journey, they went back to Turkey and they wanted to go farther into Asia. By which, again, they really mean Turkey, they didn't know about China yet. And why didn't they go further into Asia? Remember? It's, this would be Acts 16, a little before. They, they want to go further, but the Holy Spirit keeps stopping them and won't let them go into Asia. It's like, hey, their time has not yet come, or something like that. That's not what I want you to do. I want you to, well, what, what did Horace Mann say? Wasn't it Horace Mann? Go west, young man, okay? I want you to go west. And so they told Paul to go west, which means Greece and then Rome. Take it that way. Now, you want to know something really cool? Okay. While Paul was in a city in northwest Turkey, he had a vision of a man from Macedonia who said, some people think that that was Luke, but we don't know, but had a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come here, we need you. Okay. Anybody know what city he was in? When the man from Macedonia came to him? This is like ultimate classical Christian trivia right here. Man. He's in a city called Troas. What do you think Troas is? It's Troy. Now, it's not the original Troy. It's the new city of Troy, farther away from Hisarlik, the, 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 the thing that's still there, the, the mound of Hisarlik that's still there. So he's in Troy, okay? And he's called to leave Troy and go west. Can you think of somebody else that was told to leave Troy and go west? Yeah, a certain guy named Aeneas, okay? And I really think, and I'm not the only one, that Luke was thinking a little bit about Aeneas, the way he writes it. Because just like Aeneas goes from uh, Turkey, because that's where Troy is, goes from Turkey to Greece, then he ends up in an island called Malta, and then from there he goes on to Rome, right? Well, that's what, uh, that's what, uh, Aene uh, what, um, what Aeneas did. He went first to Greece, then he ended up on an island called uh, well, well, he, he went to an island called Sicily where his father died, and then he also went to Carthage in North Africa, and then he went on to Rome. Okay? So it's amazing how we find... And by the way, just to give you a tingling feeling of the numinous, kind of like Mufasa, <laughs> to give you that feeling, read Acts chapter 9 again, because that is where we get the conversion of Paul. Right after Paul's conversion, he goes to Antioch, uh, Damascus, and then he has to be let down by a basket, and then he disappears for a couple chapters. And we go back to the other folks, and we go back to Peter, and immediately Peter heals someone named Aeneas. You go back to look at him, I'm not making it up, okay? So this is kind of wild. Okay, so we're sending you west. And first he goes to Macedonia, and that, that's, that's where Alexander the Great was from, Philippi and all that stuff. Then he comes down, and he eventually makes his way to Athens. It's in Acts chapter 17, the second half of Acts chapter 17. And while he's there, he's hanging out in the Agora, that's the marketplace, the forum, and he sees that these Greeks have idols to everything. One, one writer said it's easier, to meet, it's easier to find a god than a man in Athens. Okay? He has idols to everything. He even saw an idol to an unknown god. And after he saw that, he said, I understand Marcos' lecture. I know what I'm going to do. And Paul, Paul heard my lecture. Very old. Like, like Aaron Gordon. Anyway, the, uh, how old are you? 
he went up and called a meeting. Now, Areopagus means Mars Hill. And that's why lots and lots of classical Christian folks love the phrase Mars Hill. Ares is Mars. Pegas means hill. In fact, the word pagan actually means hillbilly. Those were the hillbillies living out in the country. That's actually what it means, the hillbillies. Um, and uh, so uh, he went up to the Areopagus. Now, in the old days, you know, the time of Pericles, that's where a legislative body met. But at this point, it's where the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers would meet, and they talk about new ideas and decide whether to allow them into the city or maybe cancel them. Okay? So he comes before them, and he says, Men of Athens, which is the way Socrates would begin, Men of Athens, I can see that in all ways you are a religious people. So he begins by complimenting, for I see you have altars to every kind of idol. Notice he doesn't say idols. He's building a bridge. I see that you have, I was really hoping you were going to go in that door because I wanted to see where it went. I just studied up. It's always these mysterious, what's that? It's Narnia. There it is. It's Narnia. I just want to see if there was a mysterious door to another railroad or something. Anyway, to Houston. That would be a lot easier. I can come back more quickly. Um, so uh, he says, for I see you have a temple to every god. I even see you have a temple to an unknown god. And then Paul speaks the words that I believe the entire Greco-Roman world was waiting. And since all four of my grandparents are from Greece, it really has meaning for me. He says to them, now, therefore, what you have worshipped in ignorance, I will proclaim to you as known. And he says, the Lord God, you know, does not dwell in temples made by human hands, but out of one man he created all races of men. He scattered them. He set their time and places that they might reach after him and grope after him, though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our beings. As your own poets, pagan poets, have said, we are his offspring. Now, a lot of people don't realize that Paul is quoting two different pagan poets. One pagan poet, a guy named Epimenides, he's the one who said, in, uh, uh, in him we live and move and have our being. And there was another one named Aratus who said, we are his offspring. And in both the cases, the he is Zeus. But he's saying they didn't know it, but they were really speaking of God. And I'm here to tell you who that is. And that God proved himself by raising from the dead. Now, when he said that, the majority of them got snooty and said, oh yeah, I'm really good. I'm out of here, right? Forget it. But there were some that believed, including a woman that believed, including a guy named Dionysus, who became a Dionysus, but really pseudo Dionysus. It's kind of a fun thing. But anyway, um, the first bishop of Athens. Right? But anyway, the, um, the wonderful thing is that he is showing them that there is truth in some of your own poets, right? And that truth points the way. And he says, so far you're guiltless, right? Because you were ignorant, you didn't know, right? But a time is coming for judgment, right? And God has chosen the man by which he will judge the world, and he has given proof of it by raising him from the dead. Okay? That's the same God that sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Okay? This, this is the, so this is really the, the whole impetus. We're, we're doing what Paul did. By the way, Paul also quotes a, a line, a, a bad company corrupts good character, which comes from a Greek playwright named Menander. That wonderful who understood that ethical thing. And he also put, this is so funny. We probably, we probably don't have any Italians here. We have any Italians here? Okay. The Italians always make fun of the Sicilians. Like they're, they're not really Italians, right? Well, Greeks, we make fun of the Cretans, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're, they're a little different, right? Well, in the Bible, Paul makes fun of the Cretans. They would probably have to cancel him because he made an ethnic joke. And he said, as you're open, it's an Epimenides guy. He must have liked Epimenides. He said, the, the, the Cretans are nothing but lazy gluttons. And, 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 you know, and he says, this is what your prophet said. And it's true. It's, man, he makes fun of the Cretans. It's terrible. But, but this, he calls him a prophet. One of your own prophets said this. So he's a poet prophet now, right? But what I'm getting at is that Paul knew how to build a bridge, make a connection. Now, I'm going to blow your mind here. Because I believe that I have found an example in the Gospels where Jesus himself does this. Now, I can't prove this, but I will lay out the case for it. Okay. John chapter 11 is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. That's the seventh of the seven signs. And then John chapter 13 starts the upper room discourse. But in John chapter 12, Jesus gives his last public discourse. And while he's speaking, a group of Greeks 
go to Philip. And notice Philip is a Greek name. So maybe they felt you know, more in touch with this guy. He was still Jewish, but he had a Greek name. And they said to Philip, we want to see Jesus. And so Philip went to, to Jesus and said, these Greeks want to see you. And Jesus' response is, the hour has come that the Son of Man will be glorified. And then he says, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it will remain a single seed. But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. Now, can any of the students tell me what famous novel uses that verse as its epigram? Epigram? I know she knows. Tell them. It's the brother Ken Azov, okay? Turn to the beginning. You, you flipped that ahead too quickly, okay? <laughs> that, that, that's the, 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 the seed verse. That's almost a pun. That's the seed verse of... Okay, now. Who are these Greeks? This is the part I can't prove, but I'm going to make the case. These Greeks are obviously interested in Jewish rituals because they're there for the Passover. That's why we're told that. They're there for the Passover. They're obviously interested in it. Who could these Greeks be? I theorize that they would be from the oldest cultic group in the ancient world, the most respected. Even Caesar Augustus joined it because it was old. Caesar Augustus liked anything that was old and traditional. Uh, he, he prefer, that's, why, that's why he was pretty easy on the Jews, more so, because it was old. The Christians, well, he, he died before there were Christians per se, but he was easier on them because it was old. And I believe that they were a member of the Eleusinian Mysteries. Now, Eleusis is a city, I don't know, 10 or, 10 or 15 miles away from Athens. And at Eleusis, they celebrated the mystery linked to Demeter and Persephone. Some of you know that story. That's where the seasonal cycle guy talked about in my book, where, where uh, Hades kidnaps her and takes her down. Remember, she has a few seeds of the pomegranate. And so she has to spend nine months of the year under the earth with it. And I'm, I'm sorry, three months under the earth. And the other nine months she can spend on the earth with her mother Demeter, Ceres, Mother Nature. And that's where we get the seasonal cycle, right? Well, at Eleusis, we know that they worshipped the idea of life, death, and rebirth. They also seem to have been linked to Bacchus, the dying and rising God who's linked to the wine, just like Ceres is linked to the wheat. Um, and we also know that on their altar, they put a ripe ear of wheat. By the way, so you're not confused, uh, when a British person says corn, they actually mean wheat. It's very confusing. Uh, so except a grain of corn really means wheat. Okay? So... They, they say maize if they mean corn. So the, uh, they put a ripe ear of wheat on the thing. Now, why do I theorize that? When Jesus says, except a grain of wheat fall, you can search the whole Old Testament and you're not going to find that metaphor. You have metaphors of the sower and the seed, but you do that metaphor of the seed that dies and is reborn is not a Jewish metaphor. But it is an absolutely Greek metaphor that was at the very center of the Eleusinian mysteries, which was well known. Herodotus talks about it. People knew it, although they had a lot of mystery. We don't know everything because they, they're like the old masons. You know, they, they kept their secrets you weren't allowed to. They're supposed to kill you if you betray the secrets, all that sort of stuff. They'll you know, cut you and send you, know, burn you up and send you to the four winds, stuff like that. Um, so we don't know everything, but we know enough about it. Right? And what I'm getting at is... If those people are from Eleusis, it's like Jesus is saying to them, all these years you've been worshiping the seed that dies and is reborn. I am that seed. You see that? I am that seed. There's only one other place in the Bible that uses that metaphor, and it's 1 Corinthians 15. You know what that, what that chapter is famous for? That's Paul's famous chapter of the resurrection body. And Corinth, of course, is a Greek city, not that far from Athens. So, uh, but other than that, it's not. It's a Greek metaphor. So I really think that Jesus is building a cultural bridge, whatever, classics in Christianity, and saying, come, I have fulfilled it. Let me end by just telling you a quick story. And a lot of you know this, but why my book is titled The Myth-Made Fact. Okay. I'm sure all of you in this room know that Jesus, that C.S. Lewis was an atheist before he became a Christian, right? But a lot of people falsely think that C.S. Lewis went from atheism to Christianity directly, as is the story of Lee Strobel, Josh McDowell, and Chuck Colson. But he did. First, he became a theist, a believer in God, and then he became a Christian. I've got to stop and tell you one of the funniest stories I've ever heard. I got this from the horse's mouth, Lee Strobel, Case for Christ, 
He, he, was, he taught at my school for a little while. And I, he told me this story. He was with a friend, and he was introducing him to a new couple. And he shook his hand, and the, the woman, you know, looked at Lee Strobel and said to him, what's a theist? And he's like, oh, and he went on for 10 minutes to give her an exact definition of what a theist is, believe in God. And afterwards, the woman just had a strange look on her face the whole time. And when they walked off, Lee said to his friend, why did she look at me so strangely? I thought that, that you know, I was doing a good job. And his friend said, Lee, she didn't say, what is a theist? She said, buenos dias. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story, from him, unless he made it up. True story. Oh, wonderful, so you, you can pass that one on. Anyway, I love that. Okay, so first Lewis became a theist, and then he became a Christian. It took about a year and a half before he became a Christian. What was holding him back? One of the things that was holding him back is that Lewis, like myself, is a lover of mythology. He studied all of mythology, right? And he was a big fan of Sir James Frazier. Anybody ever heard of him? He wrote a book called The Golden, the Golden Bell. You got it. By the way, there's a new James Frazier that my daughter's in love with. I shouldn't have let her watch the show <laughs> because, yeah, Outlander, <laughs> because now you know, every man is judged by Jamie, right? You know, I don't know what to say as a Christian about it. Okay, this is a show, Outlander, where there is a fair amount of sex, but it's always between a husband and wife. So I'm not sure whether to sponsor that or not, okay? It's kind of interesting, you know, with both of her husbands, right? She has two husbands, but it's okay. <laughs> but, yeah, but it's kind of okay because she didn't, you know, anyway. But I still like the show. It's very good, and we're waiting for another season. But, but anyway, so she's ruined now. Any man has got to be Jamie now for her. But anyway, Jamie Frazier. Uh, but no relationship there, by the way. But anyway, James Frazier was not a believer. James Frazier was the, uh, what's that guy's name? Um... Ah, the guy who wrote uh, the, the Myths to Live By. Uh, oh my gosh, sorry. It just went in my mind. Uh, the one that influenced, uh, the one that influenced uh, Star Wars with all the archetypes. Uh, oh my gosh, I can't remember his name. You know, Myths to Live By, The Power of Myth. Uh, oh my gosh. It, it'll come to you later. Anyway, it is somebody that takes all the myths and lines them up to find little things. Look at all the different primitive groups and look at all their myths and archetypes and try to put them together and find commonalities. And what this guy Fraser did is he came up with an archetype he called the corn king or the corn god. And throughout cultures there's a story of a god sort of coming to earth or a demigod dying and returning, not really a resurrection, but a seasonal story of life, death, and rebirth, very much like Eleusis, right? And if you are an if you are an Egyptian, the name of your corn king is Osiris, right? If you're Greek, you call him Adonis, or you call him Bacchus. If you are a, a Babylonian, you call him Tammuz. If you are Persian, you call him Mithras. If you are Norse, you call him Balder. They all have this story that persists across different cultures. And Lewis believed, like he did from Fraser, that Jesus was just the Hebrew version of the same archetypal myth. And by the way, you can still go on atheist websites today, and their so-called proof against Christ is to tell you stories about Osiris and all that sort of stuff. Okay? They need to read their C.S. Lewis a little bit better. Lewis couldn't get over that until one day... He was taking a long walk with his friend, J.R. Tolkien, strong believing Catholic, and they were walking along Addison's Walk. Anybody been there? Anybody been to Maudlin College, Oxford? You've been there. Wonderful. Walk around. It's this old, beautiful tree-lined walk around an old deer park. And as they walked around and around, they were discussing this issue. And Tolkien says to Lewis, Jack, and it was his nickname, he said, Jack, did you ever wonder, maybe the reason that Jesus sounds so much like a myth is that Jesus is the myth that came true, the myth that was made fact. Okay, look, teach this to your students in logic class, please, okay? There is a difference between data and the interpretation of data, okay? My, my best example is when I was in sixth grade and took social studies, as I told the folks last night, they don't teach history in public school anymore. All they teach is Social studies, which is boiled over sociology and anthropology, and uh, mostly full of errors, okay? But in the sociology class, we did have one good thing, and that is we got to read the Epic of Gilgamesh. And the Epic of Gilgamesh, that ancient Babylonian epic, has a flood story. 
right? And if you had a teacher that was like mine, she said, now children, we now know that every ancient culture has a story of a global flood. And that just proves that the story of Noah is just a myth. Now, I remember even at that raw young age thinking, wait a minute, there's another way to interpret that data. If every single, this includes like Native American Indians and Aborigines. If everybody across the world has a story of a global flood, that suggests to me that maybe there was a global flood. That is the origin of all these stories. And maybe in every other culture, it only maintained its mythic value, but only in scripture, under the inspiration of the, of the Holy Spirit, do we have a historical account in Noah. Right? Or, you've all seen the picture of homology, the man's arm, a bat wing, a dorsal fin, they all have that same shape, and they use that as proof of evolution. I look at that and say, that's proof of a common designer who doesn't keep reinventing the wheel, but keeps using the same strategies, right? So, again, yeah, I suppose you could say Jesus is just a myth, but what it says to me is, if every culture has this myth, it, the desire for it must be implanted in them, and doesn't it make stake when God himself enacts our salvation, he'll do it in a way that answers those yearnings. Here's the way I put it. If you're a Christian, you believe that Jesus fulfilled all of the Old Testament law and prophets. Jesus fulfilled the law and prophets. But I would argue that he also fulfilled the highest yearnings of the pagan people. See, Jesus is not just the Jewish Messiah. He's the savior of the world. And if Jesus came and he answered the prophecies, but there was no connection whatsoever between Jesus and the pagans, it would seem like a foreign god had invaded the world. But in fact, Jesus at the top of the hill draws together the law and prophets and the good dreams and the highest yearnings of the pagan people. I've talked to a few groups about the joy of making connections of the aha moment. Well, there's an aha moment that Jesus brings everything together, the savior of the world. And we are so lucky that we have access not only to our Christian writers, but to pre-Christian writers that God used to prepare them. Now, I wrote the myth made fact because I'm a man of the West. I'm hoping someday one of my Chinese students will go back to China and write a uh, reading Chinese myth and legend through Christian eyes, or Indian, or whatever, because it's, it's gotta be there, okay? It's gotta be, there's a famous uh, missionary called Don Richardson who wrote The Peace Child and Eternity in Their Hearts. He calls them redemptive analogies. If you look hard enough in every culture, you're going to find a redemptive analogy that points to Christ. Oh, I mean, let, me, let me pray because I have to get to the airport pretty soon. Um, Father God, again, I want to thank you for uh, Bayshore and for the incredible ministry they have here. And I want to pray first for the teachers in this room that you would give them uh, the, the courage and the strength to press on and to keep finding new ways to bring these classics alive for their students. And I want to pray for the students, Lord, that you prepare them and equip them as they move on in their lives, that they would carry this legacy, that they would pass it down to their own children, that they would share it with their college mates at school, that they would be living embodiments of the joy of classical education. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Hey, wow, that was very fun. Thank you, Thank you so much. Great stuff.